Hello and welcome to the Thursday, February 22nd, 2024 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Jan today wrote up a phishing scam that used archive.org to host the actual phishing page. Archive.org, of course, most well known for its Wayback Machine that archives old websites, has also the ability to upload uh, files and archive uh, files and that's the feature being abused here so the phishing pages that are in archive.org or at least the ones that Jan talked about are not sort of accidentally indexed and copied uh, phishing pages but the phishing pages deliberately uploaded to the site by likely the person behind these phishing scams. Archive.org of course only serves static HTML but that does not prevent the attacker then from using JavaScript to make the pages more malicious or uh, more dynamic. In this particular case, for example, they are loading a screenshot of the website from thumb.io. Have seen that site used in the past for it as well, as well as uh, logos from logo.clearbit.com. Archive.org, of course, is often a site that's specifically allowed to be visited. You have to be a little bit careful here because it sort of could be used as kind of a proxy. But uh, as Jan explains, these phishing pages, because they're deliberately uploaded, not sort of what Archive.org would index from existing websites, they use a slightly different URL scheme with a four-part host name, uh, randomstring.us.archive.org, which differs from the host names typically being used for the more legitimate or more normal Wayback Machine archive.org content. And then we do have a proof of concept exploit available now for the Screen Connect vulnerability. And apparently this vulnerability is already being exploited in the wild. No surprise given how trivial it is to exploit it. The problem here is similar to another vulnerability. And I forgot what system it was. I think uh, talked about it last week. But uh, where you have essentially a setup wizard, a script that's being used when you initially set up uh, the system, still being available after the system is being set up. And uh, there are some protections here to get uh, to protect you from going directly to the setup wizard.aspx page, but just by appending, well, as it says in the proof of concept, literally anything you'll be able to bypass that check and still access this uh, page. And then, of course, you're sort of in a clear slate mode where you can just uh, set passwords and whatever, just like you do the first time you start up a screen connect. So very easy to exploit, already being exploited. You better already have it patched if you are running screen connect on-premise, if you're running it in the cloud, then ConnectWise should already have taken care of it for you. And following Signal's move from a couple of months ago, Apple now with iMessage also implemented a quantum safe encryption protocol for its messaging platform. Apple published a blog post about all of this. They're using what they're calling the PQ3 algorithm. That's just short for post-quantum and then the number three. It appears to be an in-house developed encryption protocol. This podcast isn't really sufficiently long enough uh, to really talk about all the in and outs on how it's being implemented. Just uh, one little word of caution here. The Big problem we have right now with all of these post-quantum algorithms is that there is no formal standard yet. NIST is still working on uh, clarifying what the standard will be. They had some interesting missteps here where they had sort of some of the finalists for the standard algorithms that then turned out to be weak in other ways. I think that's a little bit of word of warning here uh, to jump on this uh, quantum safe encryption uh, algorithm bandwagon too quickly. I'm not saying that PQ3 is bad. Apple usually knows what they're doing, but crypto- cryptography is hard. So uh, 
Keep in mind, uh, don't just uh, blindly implement any of these algorithms here. Try to understand them first and if possible, wait for NIST to actually come up with a standard that sort of, you know, past all the scrutiny that NIST uh, tends to throw at these algorithms. At this point, the main threat model that you have to sort of be concerned about is that data that you're encrypting today is being recorded and then later decrypted once quantum computing gets up to the level where it's actually feasible to use it to break current encryption algorithms. If uh, this is your threat model, then you certainly should be concerned about that. For anybody else, if you're developing any software, make sure you keep your encryption algorithms flexible. So later as new standards become available, uh, you can adapt them into your software. And uh, that's something that's a good idea anyway, because I always say, Encryption algorithms don't get better with age. They're not a good wine. Uh, so you always want to stay here a little bit flexible and make sure that you're able to upgrade your encryption algorithms later as new threats like quantum computing are developing. Well, that's it for today. Sorry, I went a little bit long on the uh, crypto stuff. Uh, there were also some vulnerabilities in Chrome, Firefox, Thunderbird that I didn't get to, but well, just uh, keep that stuff updated as always. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.